watched a uh, uh, video. Uh, my daughter Crystal showed it to me. Uh, and the children at the orphanage sang a song for our church. Uh, delightful, beautiful people. Uh, uh, happy children, uh, even in spite of uh, all the challenges they have. Uh, uh, so I am appealing to you one more time. Uh, what if you let something go for a month so these children could have a good year? Uh, what if you just drank regular coffee instead of the uh, uh, yeah. uh, what, what if you uh, what if you uh, said uh, we're going to we're going to go out less this month to eat than we normally go out what, what if we all sacrifice one month to make one year better for children. Uh, uh, I honestly believe it's the work of God. Um, I, I, I honestly believe that if Christ were here, he, he would be saying to you uh, the same thing I'm saying. Uh, uh, let's, let's do our very best. And uh, I want you to know uh, I, I practiced what, uh, what I preach and uh, I took uh, $2,000 out of my savings this week so uh, I could go the extra mile in helping uh, these kids. Uh, we have to do this together because every penny counts, church. You say, I don't have that much. Every penny counts when it comes to uh, uh, meeting these kids' needs. Our dear Heavenly Father, I'm glad to be on your team. I'm glad that a God like you has providentially invited me to be uh, in a relationship with you and on your team. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill me today and I could do a good job. I pray that people would go home today and say, I'm glad I went to church today because they experienced something of your goodness. Uh, I ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Massachusetts picked uh, John Adams to represent them at the Continental Congress. Virginia picked uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, John Adams was a farmer and a lawyer. And uh, Thomas Jefferson was a plantation owner. They were very, very different men, but they made a friendship at the Continental Congress. In fact, some of you know that they were both on the committee to write the Declaration of Independence. And uh, Adams said to Jefferson, you are a better author than I am. Uh, if you write the first draft, uh, we'll, we'll work on it from there. During the Revolutionary War, Adams uh, served in the Continental Congress and Jefferson became the uh, uh, governor of Virginia. Uh, when uh, the Constitution passed and we picked our first president, uh, George Washington, John Adams was his vice president and Thomas Jefferson was his uh, secretary of state. Uh, Jeff Washington had two terms and then uh, Wa uh, Adams and Jefferson ran against each other for president. Uh, and I know you think it's the worst it's ever been, but just read a little history. It got pretty ugly. And uh, Adams beat Jefferson, and uh, it created animosity between them. 
So in the next four years, in 1800, uh, uh, they ran again, and this time Jefferson beat Adams. And they stopped being friends. I mean, they did not like each other. Uh, rude things were said, insults were made, uh, innuendos, and everything you think is ugly now, it was the same then, except you had to read it in a newspaper and not see it on cable news. Adams retired to Massachusetts and farmed and did law work. Uh, Jefferson had two terms, and he retired. And year after year, everybody from the Revolution got a little older. And pretty soon, there were more of their friends in the Continental Congress who had died than were still alive. And Adams did a very gritty thing. He took out a sheet of paper and wrote Jefferson a letter. It was a, it was a letter of reconciliation. Jefferson responded and wrote Adams a nice letter. And those two men who had grown to absolutely despise each other they had a regular correspondence the rest of their life. And if you want to know the real irony of this story, they were the last two uh, uh, living uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence. They both died on the 4th of July in 1826. Jefferson died about four hours before Adams. Uh, there are divine providential things in life that uh, uh, are almost mysterious, aren't they? Uh, the reason I'm telling you this story is because I want to talk to you today about relationship grit. I want to talk to you about the kind of grit it takes to have solid, good, healthy relationships at home. The kind of grit it takes to have solid, good, healthy friendship relations. The kind of grit it takes to have healthy, uh, uh, encouraging uh, 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 work relationships. Good relationships don't just happen, they're made. And if you're going to have great relationships in your life, you got to develop some relationship grit. I want to remind you what grit means. Grit means an inner strength to keep giving your best when things get more and more difficult. It's easy to give your best when things are easy. But when things get hard, that's where it requires grit for us to continue to give our best. And relationship grit, I want to say, is um, a healthy way of relating to others. So what is best in you calls out what is best in them. In good relationships, in great teams, what is best in each individual calls out the best in others. In unhealthy relationships, we develop codependencies, and what is worst in me triggers what is worst in you, and we bring out the worst in each other. All right. Uh, Jesus is the perfect model of relationship grit. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, we're probably, uh, uh, this story picks up probably about two weeks before Christ is crucified. And Jesus and his 12 disciples and some of the, the ladies who uh, 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 followed with Jesus Christ, they were walking from Capernaum uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, it might shock you to know that is a 35 to a 36 hour walk. That means if you walked nine hours a day, it would take you four days to walk from Capernaum to uh, Jerusalem. On top of that, 
It is a mountainous uh, 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 pathway. It's not like walking through cornfields in uh, Ohio. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a demanding hike. And somewhere on this demanding hike, Jesus sat down probably in the cool of, in the, the heat of the afternoon in a cool shaded place for everybody to rest. And while everybody was sitting with them, he said, I need to tell you something again. I've told you this before in the past, but I, you didn't get it. So I, I have to tell you this again. He said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. If you have an imagination, I want you to see Jesus and the disciples sitting in some shady place. Uh, uh, they're letting the hottest part of the day pass. And Jesus says, I don't think you understand what we are all about to face. So I want to tell it to you one more time. Uh, it's one thing to be shocked by life, for things that we don't like to happen to us to happen without us having any warning. It's altogether different to know that it's going to be very, very hard and to have the grit that says, no matter how hard this is, it is so important, I'm going to see it through. Now, uh, our culture teaches us the wrong thing, church. Okay, if you, I'm not talking about your mistakes of the past. I'm just talking about right now, okay? So, Please don't take this as a mistake you've made in the past. I'm talking about the relationships you have right now. If you think the very best relationships are easy, you're never going to have the grit that you need to make a good relationship work. The very best relationships have hard times. Church? Uh, uh, I've been married to my wife 51 years. And uh, some of them were better than others. Uh, some of them I wouldn't mind doing over. But some of them, I don't want to do them over again. Okay, relationships that are going to be healthy and long-term, they require grit. They look into the future and say, there are going to be difficult times. There are going to be times we misunderstand each other. There are going to be times that we have different opinions. There are going to be times our values clash. But in spite of all of that, we have the grit to say, whatever it takes to make this work, I'm going to make it work. Church. Now please listen. We live in a culture that says something like, hey, I'm with you until you don't please me anymore, and when you don't please me anymore, I'm gone. That's the culture we live in. The tragedy of that is we stay children. I mean, that's what children in junior high do. Uh, uh, I sent you a note, and you didn't send me one back. Uh, I don't like you anymore. Uh, uh, church. Christ models a relationship grit that says, this relationship is so important to me that whatever it takes, I'm going to see it through. That is the starting point for, emotional, for uh, uh, relational grit. Now listen to what Jesus said. He's really, really detailed here. Jesus is saying, my relationship to you is so important to me that I'm willing to be delivered to the chief priest and the scribes. Now you need to remember, if you read a little earlier, 
Jesus stopped going to Jerusalem because those are the very people who tried to stone him. Uh, if you read earlier in the Gospels, the very people that he's going to be delivered over to, they had already tried on several occasions to stone him. And Jesus said, remember those angry people who tried to stone me? I'm going to be given over to them. And I'm willing to do it for you. He said, not only am I going to be given over to them, but they're going to have their little kangaroo court, and at the end of their little kangaroo court, they're going to condemn me to death. Jesus is saying, I'm willing to die for you. But it wasn't just dying. They'll deliver Jesus over, and then when, when the Gentiles get him, they're going to use uh, their cruelest mockery to humili humiliate him uh, uh, emotionally. It's hard enough to be mocked by one person, but to be mocked by an entire crowd. Jesus had the grit to take it. And then he said, they're going to flog me. Uh, I don't have the heart to describe uh, the Roman flogging today. It's just too disgusting and brutal. Jesus said, I'm going to take a brutal whipping from the Romans because of my commitment to you. In Mark's gospel, he adds, they're going to spit on me. I've always found it uh, insufferably uh, obnoxious that people spit on Jesus. Is there, is, is there a more insulting thing you can do to a good man than spit in his face? Uh, Jesus Christ said, my relationship to you is so valuable that if, if I have to take people spitting on me, I'm going to do it. Church. And then he said, they're going to crucify me. Uh, the Romans' uh, 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 masochistic uh, way of uh, humiliating and killing their enemies. Listen to what Jesus is saying. I have enough grit in my relationship with you to do the unthinkable. But I talked to you about uh, gritty faith last week. He also had gritty faith because he ends this by saying, but he will be raised on the third day. That's not the end of the story. Listen, listen. Jesus is saying good relationships take grit. In every good relationship, there are going to be times where you have to pay a price you don't want to pay. But listen to what he says. If you pay the price, there is the promise of a new life on the other side of it. Do you hear this, church? The Every time you love your family member the way God wants them to be loved, no matter what it costs you, there is new life on the other side. There is fresh hope on the other side. There is a sunrise on the other side. Uh, the problem is we lose our grit and we refuse to love the people around us the way God wants them to be loved and we end up making our relationships worse, not better. Are you hearing me, church? Do you have a heart for this? Then they got up and started walking again. And somewhere between where Jesus said that to his disciples and before they got to Jerusalem, they were at uh, another rest place and all of a sudden, Salome, the mother of James and John, came over to where Jesus was and knelt down in front of him. And she said, I'd like to ask you for something. And Jesus said, what would you like to ask? And then she motioned her boys, James and John. 
And she said, I'd like to ask that when you enter into your kingdom, that one of my sons can sit on your right side and my other son can sit on your left side. Uh, uh, this is more manipulative than, than it, it's easy to read over this, okay? Uh, some scholars believe, you know, that Salome, the mother of James and John, was Mary, Jesus' mother's sister. This is Aunt Salome. <laughs> Uh, 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 the, uh, the sister that his mother liked the most, that she was the closest to. And now she's coming and, and kneeling down in front of him, and uh, she's playing the, uh, I'm your good aunt card. Uh, uh, I'm your favorite aunt. Uh, uh, remember when I used to make the cookies you liked? Uh, uh, not really understanding how insensitive her request was. All right, let's contrast this. Jesus said, I'm gritty. I'm going to go do something that is almost undoable because of my relationship with you. Ah. Uh, in the text, I think it's Luke, it says, they still didn't understand. Right after that, as if he didn't share any of that, as if they were going to Jerusalem uh, for a picnic, Salome says, hey, ah, uh, I want my boys to have preferential treatment. I'm your aunt, they're your cousins, I mean, come on. Church? There is, a, there, is a, there is an insensitivity in that that is almost shocking. Jesus is saying, I'm so gritty, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And they're saying, you know, really, uh, we'd like some preferential treatment here. Uh, 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 I mean, come on. The, the, there is an, does anybody feel the incongruity of that? Does anybody feel how those two things just don't fit together? One is, I'm gritty, I'm going to make something happen. The other one says, I don't want to have to be gritty, I just want you to give me the freebie. Well, it turns out that's really human nature. It's really human nature. Often the reason we're not gritty is because we have the expectation that it should be easier and somebody else should be doing more. All right. Uh, every married man in here, I'm going to do you a huge favor. Uh, some of you don't need to hear this, but some of you, I'm going to do you a huge favor. Your wife will love you a hundred times more if you, if you get this lesson. Uh, Somehow or another, men, we grow up with the idea that managing the relationship is the woman's job. I don't know where I learned that, but I got that in my head. Managing the relationship is the woman's job. All right, all right. I'll tell you what, that'll ruin your marriage. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to drive that bus into the ditch, and mama's going to walk away. Uh, in fact, I've come to believe just the opposite. Listen, uh, what does it mean to be the spiritual head of my home? It means that I'm always going to take responsibility and I'm always going to initiate. I'm not going to be the passive one in our relationship, church. If, so, if, 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 uh, I, if, uh, if somebody has to apologize, I'm always going to be the first one to apologize. If, if somebody has to say, we're off track, could we sit down and talk about this? I want to be the first one to do it. That is what gritty relationships are all about. Someone says, 
I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to take the initiative in making things right. Church, brothers, brothers, uh, that's us. Uh, all right, now ladies, could I talk to you a minute? Come on, make it a little easier, would you? Uh, 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 we, do, we just need, uh, uh, we just need you to make it a little easier. Uh, uh, we're going to be more gritty, uh, but we, we need. Uh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we we have to team teach these sermons. Uh, we're all in this together. All right. So listen, listen. Jesus is my model. He says I'm gritty. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make this work. James and John are the antithesis. They're saying, I don't want to have to be gritty. I don't want to have to do these difficult things. You've got, you can make it easy. You can, just, you can just fill my name in the blank. Um, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if they would have asked Jesus, what do I have to do to be worthy to sit with you on the right or on the left when you enter into your kingdom? That's a very different question, isn't it? One is, hey, I want preferential treatment. The other is, what do I have to do to be gritty like you so I can sit with you in your kingdom? Church? Relationship grit demands more from myself than it does from others. I have to tell you that one more time. We have to start demanding less from others and demanding more from ourselves. That's the model Jesus did. Jesus demanded the most from himself and gave great grace to others. I want to remind you, Paul wrote in Romans 12, outdo one another in showing honor. Man, would that, would that change the political discourse right now if we just started outdoing each other and showing honor? Uh, what, what, might it, what, what might happen in your home if you competed to see who could show the other one the most honor as opposed to some of the other nonsense we compete about? So now Jesus is on the spot. Uh, Salome is kneeling in front of him. Uh, James and John are standing there. Uh, he's talked to them about what he's willing to do, and they're just looking for the easy way. And now Jesus, uh, Jesus has two choices. He can have a gritty relationship with them, or he can vent on them. I mean, he could have very easily say, what is wrong with you idiots? I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and, and, and I'm, and, and I'm going to walk through hell itself. And all you guys are thinking about is uh, getting the freebie. Getting, getting your name filled in a place, that, that, whether you deserve it or not. But that's not what he did. Because you see, grit means when it gets hard, I get better, not worse. So now this is a hard moment for Jesus, and we see his gritty relationship again. He says, you don't really know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Real quickly, they said, oh yeah, we're in. We got this. He said, well, you may drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Jesus takes this moment to call something better out of James and John instead of scolding them. You see, that's relationship grit. Often when I feel like I want to scold or criticize, 
That is the moment for relationship grit where I say, I'm going to call something better out of this person. Uh, look, this, I promise you this works. Uh, sometimes when I'm uh, being obnoxious with my wife, she says to me, you're better than that. And then I, I think, well, I should be. <laughs> I don't know that I, okay. Just saying you're better than that is, has a powerful effect on me. Brothers, can, can, you, can you identify with that? All right, listen, listen. Uh, that's just exactly what Jesus is saying to these two guys. Look, guys, you're better than this. I want to call something better out of you. Christ said, you do not know what you're asking. In healthy relationships, we begin to question our motives, intentions, and self-focus. All right, if I'm going to be gritty, I have to say, what am I asking the people around me for? And what does that tell me about their motives? My motives, I'm sorry. What am I asking the people around me, and what does that tell me about my motives? All right. Am I asking for things that just make my life easier and not their life easier? Am I asking for things that are uh, based on uh, my uh, motives but don't really take into account what's going on in their life? Church? Am I looking at my intentions? What do I intend to come out of this? Do I intend to use this moment to make something better, or do I intend to manipulate this moment to get my own way? And then the last is the worst of the three. Uh, often what I ask of others is an expression of my selfishness. It's not an expression of what makes for healthy relationships. Church? Church? Can you hear me? Are you with me on this? Um, if you're dozing off, there's coffee in the, uh, in the uh, coffee shop, and it's not $5. But you could give $5 to the children. Okay, here's a, here's a question that I think is helpful. How do my expectations and request affect my relationship? The thing I'm asking uh, 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 the people I work with, the thing I'm asking for at home, how do my, uh, how, do, uh, how do the things I'm expecting affect my relationship? Do they affect my relationship in a positive way or in a negative way? Will this request bring out the best in someone, or am I just trying to manipulate them to get them to do something I want to do? Church? And then Christ asked the family, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? They answered too quickly. They should have remembered what Jesus just said. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Do you really have that kind of grit? Is this really what you want? Everyone wants the rewards of winning but few are willing to pay the price to win. Church, everybody wants healthy relationships, but very few people are willing to pay the price to create healthy relationships. Everyone wants a healthy relationship, but not everyone is willing to develop the gritty skills that create healthy relationships. Relationship grit, ask better, 
of your soul before it asks better of other people's souls. Do you hear that, friends? Relation grit says, I have to do better before I ask them to do better. If I want them to do better, I've got to set example of doing better myself. God is a God of relationships. Do you know that? Jesus said, God is a God of relationships. I can't give you what you're asking because the Heavenly Father, he's got that prepared for someone that he wants to have it. I'd like to introduce you to the concept of divine providence. I've talked to you about it before, but I, I, I want to use those, that exact vocabulary, divine providence. Uh, this is what the Westminster Confession says. God, the creator of all things, upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of his glory, wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. All right, I know that's a big sentence. I can say it in an easy way. God is so smart and so good, he knows the ideal position for absolutely everyone. Have you ever thought you wanted a position and you got it and you said, this doesn't work for me at all? No? Listen, divine providence is God saying, I know you so well I know exactly where you were fit best. I know you so well, I know the exact people that you need in your life. I know you so well, I know the exact people who need you. Over the years, I've had many people come into my office and say, you know, I, I, it wasn't God's will for me to marry this person, and so now I'm getting rid of them, and now I know it's God's will for me to marry this person. And I'm always thinking to myself, uh, well, you thought the very same thing when you did this. Uh, listen, uh, uh, relationships are one of God's ways of making us better people. And maybe the conflict you feel in that relationship is just God sanding on your character a little bit to get you to be a better person. You get that? My, my, my beautiful wife is divine sandpaper. Uh, 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 if not a divine chainsaw, maybe it takes more than uh, a sandpaper sometime. God has done good things in my soul by my wife and I not getting along. And it required me to pray, and it required me to think, and, and, and I had to change, and I had to become a different person. And that was the work of God in me. That is divine providence using relationships even when they are at their hardest to make us better people. Amen. Well, as you can guess, the team heard it. The other 10 heard what was going on, and then they got ugly. Uh, uh, the request triggered jealous anger in uh, the other disciples. Uh, here is relationship grit. I got to pay attention to what goes on inside of me when good things happen for other people that I want to happen for me but don't happen for me. Listen, please listen. This is, I want to say this in a better way. I got to pay attention to what's going on inside of me when something good happens for someone else that I want to happen for me but it doesn't happen for me. I got to pay attention to that because that's relationship grit right there too. Church, 
See, these 10 guys, they couldn't be happy at all if Jesus had said, yeah, I'll give you those slots. Because they selfishly wanted them themselves. Right? I got to pay attention to what's happening in my heart when I start to feel angry jealousy because somebody else has something I don't have that I want. This requires, uh, this requires a relationship grip. And we have a model in the Bible on what to do. When Jesus started baptizing more people than John, John's disciples came to him and said, hey, what's up? The guy you baptized is baptizing people and nobody's coming to us and everybody's going to him. And listen to what John said. A man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from above. A man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. Can you hear this? Jesus said, James and John, I know you want these spots, but only the heavenly Father is wise enough to know who gets those spots. And by the way, he said, uh, do a heart check. What's going on in you that you can't appreciate that God in his wisdom knows the best spot even if it doesn't belong to you? Because nobody can receive anything and let's give them to him from heaven. Do you hear this? Everything I have is given to me from heaven. Everything you have is given to you from heaven. And if you don't have something that you think you need, it's very possible that your heavenly Father knows you better than you know yourself. Church. That my heavenly Father knows I, uh, I would lose my license if I had a vet. Uh, he knows that. Uh, just a little harder to lose your license with a Ford F-150. Um, all right. Relationship grit says, I'm going to start paying attention, and I'm going to look at the things that make me angry and jealous, and I'm going to make those issues so that I bring a better self to everything. Church? And then Jesus said, guys, I got to teach you how we're different. Jesus called everybody together, and he said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. This is what Jesus said. The model you see out there for relationships is not a healthy model. There is a better model. He said, when you look out at the world, you see uh, they lord it over them. People use their position in improper ways. That's just what James and John and Salome did. They, it, it, Salome's his aunt, James and John is his cousin, and they're trying to use their position in an improper way. And Jesus said, that's not relationship grit. He said the second thing is they use their authority in an improper way. That's not. He said at the essence of relationship grit, there are two verbs, serve and give. If we're going to have relationship grit, we have to serve the people around us and we have to give to the people around us the best of who God has made us. If you want to improve all your relationships, you can do two things. You can start saying, how can I serve this person the way God wants them to be served? Brothers, every day I pray, dear God, help me to love my wife today the way you want her to be loved. Uh, help me to love my wife today the way you want her to be loved. Uh, we, get a lot be we get along a lot better when I pray that. Church, at the essence of relationship grit is I want to see 
what has God done in me that gives me the ability to share my very best and I'm going to serve with my very best? I'm not giving secondhand service. If I got to get up when I don't want to feel like getting up and go and get potato chips, I'm going to get up and go get potato chips because that's the kind of guy I want to be, church. And then the second is, relationship grit requires giving. You see what Jesus said? I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm just going to give myself away for you. I'm just going to give myself away for you. In great relationships, there is an impulse to give. There's an impulse to give encouragement, appreciation, a time, a help. Whatever, what, whatever the relationship needs, in great relationships, grit says, I serve and I give because that makes relationships healthy and good. If we are empowered to serve and to give, I promise you, every relationship you have will be touched in some way. Will every, will every relationship you have be perfect? No. None of them will be perfect. But guess what? You'll have healthier relationships in everything you do because the human soul is created to, with, a, with a, a delight in being served and with, and with a, a delight in somebody sharing the best of who they are. The human soul is designed by God to thrive on those things. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would teach us to have gritty relationships. I pray that we would never give up too soon. I pray that we would never give in too soon. I pray that uh, there would be a new impulse in our hearts to look at the people you've placed in our lives and say, how can I serve this person the way you want them to be served? To look at the people around us and say, what have you done in my heart, God, that I can give something good to them that makes their day better, uh, 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 makes them feel appreciated, makes them feel encouraged, makes them feel strengthened, uh, uh, makes them feel inspired. And then I pray that Christ would receive all the glory. Amen.